You know, he was part of a unique Canadian comedy troupe. Remember Kids in the Hall? From there, Dave Foley moved on to news radio. There was television, movies. Dave joining us in studio today. Hello, Dave. Hello. How are you? I am I'm good. I, I loved you in news radio, loved Kids in the Hall. I want, though, to know, when people see you, meet you, who do they recognize you from more? News radio, Kids in the Hall? Uh, mostly the movie Postal. Postal. Uh, they really remembered yeah. you in that. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think it's pretty evenly split between Kids in the Hall and News Radio. Well, I was uh, 17 when mm -hmm. I started doing stand-up and uh, did it for a couple of years and then sort of gave it up when I met the other kids in the hall. So I took about a 30-year uh, break from it. Uh, there was one key kid in the hall, though, that you met that set things in motion. It was uh, Kevin McDonald. Yeah, he and I met at a, at a uh, Second City uh, improv workshop mm -hmm. and uh, sort of were randomly paired up by our instructor, Alan Gutman. Uh, who I think is an instructor over at uh, the Humber College in Toronto now. Oh, all right, okay. Um, and we were just sort of randomly one, two, one, two paired up, and um, and we managed to make each other laugh doing a mirror exercise, which is one of the lamer of improv <laughs> exercises. Uh, not that they aren't all lame. Um, and we managed to make each other laugh doing a mirror exercise. And we thought, and we each thought, well, this guy's pretty funny. And by the end of the class. Uh, Kevin had done a bunch of funny scenes on stage, and I'd done a few, and uh, and uh, he sort of said, hey, why don't you join my improv team? And that went on to become the uh, the first version of the Kids in the Hall. I, I want to talk about some of the differences, though, when it comes to stand-up, where you control things, to improv, or even more the collaborative comedy troupe that you experienced with Kids in the Hall. How difficult is that? Because to me, stand-up is, you're all in, you're in control. Um, yeah, but that's kind of, I mean, that's been... Part of my whole career, happily, is that I've been in, I've been in control of what I do mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, you know, especially my my formative years. You know, like being a member of the Kids in the Hall, the five of us had a lot of control over everything we did. I mean, we wrote our own material, and we you know we made all the decisions on our own show. Mm -hmm. So that's not a big deal to me. But it's but definitely the portability of stand up is different. Um, I've always kind of envied that with my friends that are stand-ups that they can just you know you know get on a get on a plane and show up with a you know a, a toothbrush and do a show you know they can do a week you know and um, you know we're sketch comedy it's you know it's an eighteen wheeler and two tour buses and you know and, and months of preparation. So that's the positive is that it's really just you. Yeah. But at the same time, is that a bit of a negative too because it's really just you? You know. Yeah, do but you, I'm really good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, so that's 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 the. Uh, I meant you're that's on what the makes road. It all right. You're on the road by yourself <laughs> so much. You know, before with kids in the hall, you, you really had a sense of family. Yeah. Sometimes a, a bit of a dysfunctional <clears throat> family, but it was a family. Well, definitely being on the road with the group is is uh, it's it's more fun traveling as the kids in the hall, the traveling part of it. Right. You know, because you got you got some you know you got guys you know you got your oldest friends in the world there to go out for drinks with after the show. Right. You know. Whereas now it's virtual strangers that I'm out drinking with after the show. You know, <laughs> you, sadly. You're okay with that? You know, it's just me sadly at the end of the show going, so is anyone going out anywhere? Where do you guys Yo, go? Oh, it's Dave Foley. You can't go out for mm -hmm. drinks with Dave Foley. <laughs> yeah. Dave, I want to play a clip. I would warn people that they probably shouldn't. They shouldn't. Of course, I can't let Dave Foley go without talking about his days on news radio. So I just want to set it up because there was just such great characters. Everyone on that show was such a great character. Talk about an ensemble cast. But, of course, Dave was the news director of the New York radio station. There was crazy Matthew, played by Andy Dick. And, played by and the much crazier Andy Dick. Much crazier <laughs> Andy Dick. You know, it was successful for five years, despite one of the executives at NBC. It almost appeared that he wanted to sabotage it. It didn't just almost appear that way. It, it was actually stated as such uh, by the man who was doing it. Yeah, a guy named Preston Beckman, who uh, he, he hated the show much that... Um, a journalist for Rolling Stone magazine was going to write a piece about wh about why news radio wasn't getting the support it deserved from NBC, and he called up Preston Beckman and said, uh, "You know, why do you think NBC isn't isn't uh, pushing this show as, as much as they should?" Uh, and Preston Beckman said, "You think that show's funny? I don't think it's funny. I think the show lacks testosterone." <laughs> That's a quote. And the journalist from Rolling Stone magazine called up our showrunner Phil Sims, uh, Paul Sims, I should say, and said uh, said uh, why uh, you should just know that this guy's this guy is uh, bad mouth in your show, and he's the guy in charge of scheduling you, and he, and like and the, the journalist refused to print it, you know. 
And so despite having time slots changed... Yeah, it, eight time slots. Eight times. Yeah, it was hard to find, slots. wasn't it? Yes. At one point, we were in a theoretical... Uh, we were on a theoretical day. Uh, one that physicists had proposed might exist <laughs> in a nine-dimensional universe. <laughs> you were able to go to news radio at a time when Kids in the Hall... Well, it was getting a little rocky on the, the cast of Kids in the Hall, wasn't it? Yes. Weren't you working well, on... Well, it started brain? out rocky. <laughs> <laughs> Did it really start out? And see, was this because there's all these creative guys? You mentioned control earlier. You like to have control. Yeah. Did you all want to have all this creative control and it was harder to work in that collaboration? Well, all five of us felt like we were the smartest guy in the group. And the only guy, and, and <laughs> everyone else was sabotaging it. Uh, and, we, and we came out of, I mean, we came out of, a, you know, we were a bar band, essentially, back in the, back in the uh, early 80s, mm -hmm. you know, so it was still like, you know, on the, you know, we, I guess we were still influenced by punk, and we felt like that, uh, you know, if you're an artist, that meant you had to fight and be vicious and horrible to each other. Against the man. Yeah, and each other. <laughs> yeah, know? the man happened to be your colleague, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Joe Starmer and Mick Jones hated each other. <laughs> How the heck did you get a show together then every week? Uh, well, we, it was always that we, could, we would fight constantly, like even in our club days. We'd fight constantly up until showtime. And then once the show started, we would all like fall in love with each other again. Put on you your know? show face. Yeah, it wasn't even that. It was mm -hmm. like as soon as you're on stage performing with the other guys, you sort of go, "Oh, man, they're funny," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that was always the payoff to it. You know, like we'd have a we'd spend a horrible week treating each other just dreadfully, and then you'd get on stage, and the other guys would be so good, and everybody would give like absolute commitment to everything they were doing. And everybody wanted everything to work. So mm -hmm. it was like, there was never any, no one would ever sabotage you in the scene. <laughs> that was good. Lauren Michaels, was he the executive producer? He for... was our executive producer, yeah. So I I'm surprised that the kids in the hall then weren't sort of snapped and put on SNL. Well, we were originally scouted for uh, Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. by Lauren. Uh, Lauren didn't come up. He sent up Al Franken and Jim Downey mm -hmm. came up. And we did, a, we did a show for them in an empty empty club in our the Rivoli with nobody there. Actually, Dave Thomas was there. He came and, and watched. Uh, no audience. No audience. All right, okay. And we did a show, and they, um, and they, they hired uh, Mark McKinney and Bruce McCullough to come down as apprentice writers uh -huh. in 85, which was Lauren's first year back after leaving the show for five years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and back then, I used to think five years was a long period of time. Um, and so then at, at the end of that season... Because uh, Mark and Bruce kept flying up to Toronto on their weeks off and did to do shows with us in, mm -hmm. at the Rivoli, and at the end of the season, Lauren said, "Well, I, I want to see this troupe and see if there's anyone else in this group that uh, I should bring up." Because he kept hearing reports from like Catherine O'Hara and Marty Short, and you know, and right. all you know, all these people kept calling him up and saying, "You really have to see this group." And so he finally came up, and uh, we, <laughs> we subjected him to like a, a two and a half hour show. Uh, and uh, he didn't leave. He didn't leave. Mm -hmm. He tried to leave before the improv set, uh, but we harangued him into staying for the improv <laughs> set. No, really, stay. We've got even better stuff. Yeah, it wasn't even like that. He was going. Well, I th well, I think I'm going to get going. I really enjoyed. It. No, Lauren, you got to stay for the improvs. <laughs> no, Lauren, it would be really offensive to us if you left. 